Welcome to Sengoku Daimyo's Chronicles of Japan. My name is Joshua, and this is episode 82, The Fate of Nimna. Before we get into this episode, a few notes. First off, this episode deals with war and with the trauma that brings to include issues of death, sexual assault, and enslavement. I'll try to be delicate, especially where we don't need it to get the larger story, and perhaps reference some of it more fully in the show notes at sengokudaimyo.com slash podcast, so go there for more information. That said, I don't want to just gloss over it either. These were violent times, and history often deals with subjects we'd rather not talk about. We just don't have to sensationalize it either. As we discussed last episode, we are in the reign of Ame Kuniyoshi, a.k.a. Kimmei Tenno. According to the dates given in the Nihon Shoki, Ame Kuniyoshi, the youngest son of O Hodo no O Kimi, a.k.a. Keitai Tenno, well, he reigned from about 539 to his death in 571. 32 years is a pretty respectable reign for any sovereign, especially considering that two of his half-brothers had taken the throne ahead of him. Add to this the thought that he may have been co-ruling in some capacity even before then, and it is little wonder that he has quite the entry in the Chronicles. And yet, most of his entry is taken up with an almost singular focus on one thing, Nimna, the polity on the Korean peninsula that is also known as Mimana in Japanese or Imna in modern Korean. We've talked about Nimna in the past, and it's more than a little controversial. Sometimes it is ignored as a complete fabrication of the Japanese chroniclers, and other times it is equated with the larger Gara Confederation. But I suspect the truth lies in a complicated middle ground that cannot be fully explained as we only have external accounts regarding its existence. For my part, I think there's enough evidence to suggest that Nimna was a real place, and a place of some import, as it shows up in things like the Guangeto Stili, as well as in some of the Sinitic records. So it isn't something that the writers completely made up. At the same time, any talk of Mimana ni Honfu, suggesting direct control by Japan or Yamato, is just as likely made up to support Yamato's own causus belli, and may even have been included in some of the earlier documents that the chroniclers themselves were drawing from. There's also the possibility that the term Nimna was no longer in use, but still referenced by Yamato, much as they tended to refer to anything in the Yangtze River Basin as Kure, or Wu referencing an old dynasty that had long since been supplanted by others. A lot of what we read about Nimna comes from the Bekje records that the chroniclers frequently quoted. Unfortunately, there's no extant copy of this record, and all that we have is the fragments quoted in the Nihon Shoki, where the chroniclers frequently embellish the accounts. It doesn't even look like this made it into things like the Tonkam or the Samguk Sagi, so... Not quite sure where exactly we might find other corroborating evidence. Now, the chroniclers, as they were borrowing accounts from this record, well, they would often equate, for instance, the Wa ethnonym, that is, the term Wa used to refer to people of ethnic Wa descent, or who were speaking a Japonic language, perhaps, as an automatic reference to actual subjects of Yamato. It is much more likely, though, that there were a variety of ethnic Wa polities, or at least multi-ethnic states with a sizable Wa population, both on the peninsula and in the archipelago, outside of those territories that were directly controlled by Yamato. That said, by the time the chroniclers were writing, Yamato really was the only Wa polity around. Well, at least if we don't count the Ryukyus. At the time, though, Yamato likely did hold a place of prominence and even immense influence across many of the Wa polities on the archipelago, and possibly on the peninsula. But things weren't as cut and dried as we tend to think of it regarding states and countries and the control they have today. It's quite possible, even likely, that Nimna was important to Yamato, and most especially to the trade that occurred between Yamato and the rest of the continent. Based on various descriptions, Nimna, or the territory defined as such, bordered both Bekje and Shilla, and it may have been made up of smaller polities, possibly with a core polity of Nimna at its head. I could even conceive that there may have been a semi-permanent Yamato embassy set up in Nimna, and possibly with the other polities as well, though the idea that Yamato was actually controlling these states seems to be 
too much of overreach, at least to my mind. Now, prior to 539, we are told that Nimna had been incorporated into Shilla's territory around 532, and Aston notes that in the Tongkam, the name Nimna doesn't show up after that date. This is also one of the dates generally accepted for the end of any independence of the Gara Confederacy as a whole, and when Gumguang Gara is said to have submitted to Shilla. As for the presence of ethnic Wa people on the peninsula, that does seem fairly well established, assuming some accuracy to the Bekje record being quoted in the Nihon Shoki. There are several members of various families listed in the accounts that really feel as if they are clear references to people of ethnic Wa descent. These are listed alongside other family names, likely of Bekje, Shilla, or similar backgrounds. People like Mononobe no Makumu, who is listed as having the Bekje court rank of Sitok, and who is being sent by Bekje with another envoy, whose name is something like Chinmu Kimun. There is also a Kinoomi, who is listed as a Bekje envoy with the Bekje court rank of Nasol, who was also sent with other Bekje envoys to the country of Ara or Ala. There is speculation by a later commentator that Kino Omi may have been the son of a courtier who had been sent on one of the expeditions from the archipelago and a Bekje woman that he settled down with. Then there is Charo Mato, who apparently was born of a Korean mother, likely meaning ethnically from the peninsula, but not of Wa descent. Charo Mato held the title of Omuraji in the Yamato court, meaning he was the head of a prestigious family, apparently, but he also held the rank of Namanye in the Shilla court and went around, quote-unquote, wearing foreign dress. And yet the records still go on to identify him as being of Wa descent. While we've discussed the possibility that there were enclaves of Wa in the peninsula since ancient times, it's also possible that members of families from the archipelago emigrated to the peninsula for one reason or another. For example, we have Kawachi no Atae. This individual is noted in the Chronicles as the Japanese authority in the country of Ara, sometimes, as I said, called Ala, which was one of the polities that was apparently lumped into the larger Gara Confederacy. At the same time, it looks like Kawachi no Atae may have been someone who had been exiled from Yamato, or somewhere in the archipelago, suggesting that he wasn't actually a Japanese authority, but rather that he was probably a local official who happened to be of Wa descent, probably stemming from his birth in the archipelago. In the case of a name like Kawachi no Atai, that certainly appears to be a locative in the Yamato area, of course, but the whole story leaves me with really more questions than answers. Now, as I stated, much of this information comes from the Bekje records that the chroniclers then embellished. So, for example, the chroniclers couch almost all of Bekje's interactions as being subservient to Yamato, rather than as those of an independent ally. And so, as we look at this account, I'm going to try my best to address what is going on without too much of the chroniclers' biases coming through. But without independent confirmation from another source, that can be somewhat difficult, as Many of the stories here are not found in the remaining records in the Samguk Sagi or Samguk Yusa, for example. Now, I'd like to start with something out of the Samguk Sagi, which tells us that in 502, the country of Shilla finally came to be known by that name. You see, up to that point, it had been known as Sara or Saro, evolving as it had from a coalition of about six city-states on the eastern edge of the Korean peninsula. Important in this name change is that they decided to use Xing, which basically means new, as one of the characters for this new uh, country. The name actually translates to like Shinra, although Shilla is the more modern pronunciation. There was definitely a sense that it was an up-and-coming and expanding polity. Now, as you may recall, during the reign of Ohodo, a.k.a. Keitai Tenno, there was discussion of Yamato hosting talks in Ara around 514. Now, in reality, those were probably talks hosted by Ara itself, which seems to have risen to some prominence at this point. We talked about that somewhat back in episodes 76 and 77. 
Later in 529, Bekje gained access to a port to better facilitate communication with their ally Yamato, or at least that's the excuse that is given. This is presented as a gift by Yamato to Bekje, but apparently the king of Gara had other ideas. Now, Gara had already been on friendly terms with Shilla since at least 527, and it seems that after this they turned even more towards Shilla's embrace. Indeed, the Shilla annals in the Samguksagi tell us that the Gumgwangara king requested a Shilla princess around this time, an event that is also recorded in the Nihon Shoki and would suggest they were looking for a marriage alliance to cement their position with the powerful Shilla neighbor. What began as a marriage alliance, however, quickly turned into outright subjugation, and they're counted as little more than a territory of Shilla by 532. Ara likewise seems to have been in Shilla's sphere of influence, if not outright subjugated by that point, at least if the Nihon Shoki is to be believed. Many consider this the point at which the Gara Confederacy had pretty much been dissolved, though some histories consider that the individual polities retained at least a modicum of independence, resisting complete absorption for another generation or two until about 560. In the current reign, things start out in 540, one year into Kame Kuniyoshi's rule. King Song of Bekje brought together a bunch of representatives of the smaller polities, ostensibly to talk about re-establishing Nimna. This is sometimes known as the Sabi Conferences, named for the Bekje capital where they likely occurred. Against the backdrop of Shilla expansion, Bekje wanted to prop up some of the buffer states in between the two kingdoms. They urged on Nimna multiple times to re-establish themselves, promising aid, but Ara seems to have balked and suggested a more diplomatic route. This may have been because they were already on the side of Shilla. Bekja certainly makes that accusation of Kawachi no Atai, who apparently held some influence in Ara. The Chronicles claim Bekja did this to carry out the whim of the Yamato court. In fact, however, it's much more likely that they were playing their own chess game with Shilla on the continent. The extent to which their ally Yamato was actually involved is kind of hard to say. Certainly, we have examples of Bekja and Shilla making their own alliances. For example, in 525, Bekja records that they exchanged gifts of friendship with Shilla, though Best, who translated the records, suggests that this may be misplaced chronologically, as there's no corresponding record in the Shilla annals of the Samguksagi. Then, of course, in 530, the Nihon Shoki notes that Shilla and Bekje teamed up against a rogue Wa commander, Ken Onoomi. But then in 537, we have Yamato supporting Bekje against a supposed Shilla Goguryeo alliance. All of these shifting alliances make the accounts read like two very different stories that have been intertwined. On the one hand is the story of Bekje trying to help the mighty Yamato restore the innocent country of Nimna, despite the pernicious interference of the irreverent Shilla. On the other hand, we see friendly, or at least tolerable, relations between Shilla, Bekje, and Yamato, each agreeing to meet with each other and even ally with the other as the need arose. Unfortunately, we aren't given many of the deeper thoughts or reasonings. I lean towards discounting many of the stories that make Shilla out to be the bad guy for everything. In fact, it's much more believable that rather than overarching themes, it was much more complicated, and even local situations where alliances were more matters of convenience and where, even during war, the various states kept up some kind of dialogue. In addition, we have to remember the biases of the chroniclers who knew what was coming. In the 7th and 8th century, it was Shilla who was Yamato's rival, and so here we see them, with the benefit of hindsight, building up to that conflict. This probably means an overemphasis on the threat Shilla posed at any given time. As for ethnic Wa involvement in events on the peninsula, while they were not all the responsibility of Yamato, there may be more than a few that were. After all, there were those from Yamato who had been sent on raiding parties and in war bands for one reason or another over the past couple centuries. Then there were various envoys who could spend considerable amounts of time in a foreign land and even settle down and have kids, and they appear to have some measure of autonomy while they were over there. There was also likely another reason for people to move from the archipelago, which was the expansion of Yamato's own power. As Yamato exerted greater and greater centralized control, anyone on the outs with the ruling authorities, well, they may have wanted to seek refuge elsewhere, and given the fluid nature of things at this point in time, 
it doesn't seem unreasonable that they may have moved to Bekja, Shilla, or even to some of the states in between. Once there, if they had the administrative experience, perhaps they were able to find a place for themselves in their new home's own government structure. The Nihon Shoki records plenty of examples of Bekje, Shilla, and even Goguryeo people coming to live in the island chain, so why wouldn't some people go in the other direction? This could also explain Yamato's own somewhat laissez-faire attitude towards Bekje's considerable entreaties to get a handle on the various Wa peoples on the mainland, given that they probably had no way to actually compel them to return, let alone listen to what they said. This was likely a source of consternation for the peninsula, much as various pirates and similar independent adventurers would be in later centuries, when the central government often could not, or simply would not, rein in the excesses of those on the periphery. The Yamato court may have even endorsed the behavior of some of these various Wa folks, at least to some extent. There are hints that they were in close contact with Shilla as well as Bekje, though the relationship does feel more tense in general. We have to remember that our chronicles are largely from either early Japanese sources or from Bekje sources viewed through an early Japanese lens. Meanwhile, the Samguksagi tends to take a very pro-Shilla point of view, while the other entities involved don't get much of a voice at all. Speaking of these other entities, there are three other polities that are mentioned in the attempt to reestablish Nimna and to allow the various members of the Gata Confederation to have their independence back. One of these we know as something like Tekitan, which we're told lay between Gara and Shilla, and so without aid from a powerful neighbor, like Nimna, it was constantly harassed. Then there is South Gara, which was small and weak, and without any real allies that it could call on. While we don't know the exact position, one assumes it was probably on the coast, again, near Gara and Shilla. Then there was the state of Chakshun which is frankly depicted as evil and double-dealing, and thus basically deserving of their eventual fate. I can't help but wonder if, in a way, these aren't just general stand-ins for the stories that happened again and again, both in the peninsula but also in the archipelago. Smaller polities ended up as pawns, being used as buffers between larger, more powerful rivals, and often became the ground on which the more powerful states would fight. That meant that most of the damages would accrue to the local lands, and whatever the motives might have been of Shilla, Yamato, or Bekje, that was likely disastrous for the local population, and only further hindered their own growth. Now, Bekje regularly tried to entreat Nimna to side with them and to effectively break away from Shilla control, but there's plenty of evidence that at least some in Nimna were willing partners with Shilla. Bekje complains, for example, about one individual named Isumi, whom we are told is the Omi in Nimna, may refer to his role as a minister, or else is just a mistranslation of the name Isumi no Omi. I'm not quite sure. He's accused by Bekje of conspiring with Shilla to attack. At the same time, recall that Bekje had annexed territory from Nimna and basically refused to give it back, claiming that it was necessary as a buffer in case Shilla decided to attack them. Really, I don't see a shining example of virtue in any of this. Bekje eventually decided to set up its own fortresses along the river between Ara and Shilla, presumably with Ara's support. Tensions were certainly ramping up, and Bekje's own reasoning for setting up the fortresses was to make it impossible for the Shilla farmers on the other side of the river, presumably the Nakdong River at this point, to be able to tend to their fields. The reasoning given is that if Shilla found it too difficult, they would just give up the fortresses they themselves had erected, and the independent buffer state of Chakshun, which Scylla had also swallowed up, could be restored. I've got no idea just how realistic that was, but it doesn't sound like the kind of thing that normally would happen. Now here I'd love to give a blow-by-blow -blow of just what took place, but we have too much happening too quickly. Besides the confrontation between Bekje and Scylla over control of the various territories between them, there was still a threat from Goguryeo at the head of the peninsula. In about 546, a succession dispute in Goguryeo led to fighting between some of the elite factions in the court over their preferred candidates to the throne, leading to massive conflict. Several years later, Goguryeo was again threatening areas to the south, possibly with the support of some of the smaller polities, such as Ara, who may have been looking to break out from both Bekje and Shilla control. 
In response, Bekja appears to have requested assistance from Yamato, but the nature of travel across the straits meant that any troops were slow in coming. This may be why Korean sources like the Tongkam note that Bekja allied with Shilla to help stop the Goguryeo threat. Now this appears to go back to a long-standing agreement between Bekja and Shilla, to at least 493, where they mutually agreed to push back against Goguryeo even as they continued to bicker with each other over their territories in their own regions. During this latest Goguryeo incursion, Bekje even laid some blame on the quote-unquote Wa authorities in Ara, whom they said called Goguryeo to come in the first place. Yamato, for their part, had to deny any complicity. They certainly hadn't egged on Ara to call for Goguryeo to come help. In fact, Yamato was intending to send their own people to Ara to help repopulate that country. This all feels like a mess, that really is the sense I'm getting. There was a lot happening, and things could change at a moment's notice. Through it all, though, Yamato and Bekje maintained pretty good relations, even if they didn't always agree. By 551, it appears as though Bekje and Shilla had pushed back on Goryeo, forcing them to abandon Hansyong, aka modern Seoul, and later the area known today as Pyongyang. In 552, Bekje abandoned Hansyong and Shilla occupied it possibly the Pyongyang area as well, setting up two towns known as Utopang and Nimipang. In 553, Bekje was requesting more troops from Yamato, and five months later an emissary was on his way back to Bekje with equipment and promises of troops. In the meantime, it seems that Shilla had been busy allying themselves with Goguryeo, or at least that's how the Nihon Shoki portrays it, and according to that record it looked like they were coming to planning to attack Bekje. And so Prince Yo Chiang, son of King Song of Baekje, led troops against Goguryeo. This is one of the first in-depth accounts we really get of the fighting, although it still remained focused on the personal. And in this case, the focus was on the prince, who led his troops out to a large plain and set up entrenchments, presumably to await the arrival of their Goguryeo opponents. They were not disappointed. Local boys, possibly overseeing their herds or tending the fields, had seen the arrival of the Bekje troops and sent word. Overnight, an army had appeared. Prince Yo Chang had heard the sound of instruments in the night, but could see nothing. He had his own men beat their drums in response, and they kept a strict watch. The next morning, they saw the Goguryeo troops arrayed around them with banners covering the fields as hill is covered in green foliage. Or, so the chronicles tell us anyway. A man approached on horseback. He wore a gorget or neck guard and was accompanied by two others who carried instruments like cymbals and then two more who were adorned with leopard's tails in some fashion or other. This Goguryeo honor guard indicated someone of rank and status who had come for initial parley. The Goguryeo prince asked whom they were fighting. Yo Cheng answered that he was one of the same name as they were. That is, he called on his claim to a common Buyo ancestry with Goguryeo and he mentioned that his rank was that of Hansol and that he was 29 years old. Likewise, the Goguryeo prince responded with his own details, which are not recorded, unfortunately, and then they got things started off. First, before the battle, they set up a marked area of the field. Here, the two princes would do single combat before the rest of the battle would commence. And so the Bekje and Goguryeo princes fought. Eventually, the Bekje prince knocked his opponent from his horse with his spear, killed him and cut off his head, raising it on his spear point and showing it off to his troops. This gruesome display was met with joy by his own troops, but I dare say not so well by the other side. After that, the rest of the forces engaged, and Bekje eventually pushed back the Goguryeo forces. So why tell you all of that? There isn't a single mention of Yamato, and this is all happening in the north. Okay, it's in the chronicles, but why does that matter to us? Heck, why did it matter to the chroniclers? Well, we could point how Yamato used the Bekje records as if they were an extension of their own power and hegemony, and therefore a Bekje victory was a Yamato victory, at least in their eyes. This also may be taken out of context as an effort to support the view that Shilla and Goguryeo were allying. In his translation of the Bekje annals in the Samguk Sagi, Jonathan Best points out that Shilla had been attacking Goguryeo only a year or two earlier. So would the two really be allying against Bekje at this point? They don't appear to have given up the territory they gained from Goguryeo, 
And so I have to wonder if this doesn't come from earlier, when a Baekje Shilla alliance took Hanxiang and then the area of modern Pyongyang from Goguryeo control. Regardless, what interests me, besides the fact that it is one of those few accounts of an actual battle, sparse and biased as it may be, is that the form of battle shown here is remarkably similar to something we see later in the Heian and Kamakura periods with the rise of the samurai warriors. It's this concept of single combat and even the announcing of names. This was key, particularly in times when you didn't know who was who on the battlefield. First things first, is this an enemy in front of you or an ally? And where did they come from? And well, what was this all about? Why were they attacking? These are not questions easily answered by the dead, and where's the prestige in defeating an unknown enemy? That said, did it really happen like this? Did they honestly have these kinds of norms around fighting, at least on the peninsula? Quite possibly they did at times, though it's also just as possible that this was more of a literary device than anything else, something to let the reader know what was going on and who was involved. But this is the history that later Japanese would be reading, and so I think it's important to keep that in mind. This also seems to kick off the wars in earnest. Up to this point, a lot of the fighting, assuming it happened, was largely off screen, so to speak, with a focus on more diplomatic efforts or simply the building of fortresses. It's not dissimilar to the early setup in a game, though this was no laughing matter. Outside of the glory or derision given to individuals on the pages of these historical records, we can't forget that there was a very real and human cost in what was happening. Fighting meant death and destruction, and displaced people across the peninsula. We see them coming to the archipelago and being settled in various areas, but we also see people enslaved and offered as diplomatic gifts. These are people who were forced from their homes and their lives, all because of aspirations of the powerful elites who directed soldiers to fight and die at their behest. We may not always see it, but as we listen to what was happening, Let's not forget the human toll around all of this. Coming back off of his victory in late 553, Prince Yo Chang continued his offensive against Shilla, this time taking the fight to them directly. They sent for the Wa troops that had been gathered in Tsukushi, and Baekje sent a general with Mononobe no O to ask for more. In early winter, they were ready to begin their assault. Baekje and Yamato troops attacked Shilla, but it wasn't enough. This may account for a record in the Samguksagi, which claims that Shilla seized the northeastern border region of Baekje in that same year, incorporating it into their own domain. The records say Baekje sent 10,000 men in their fight to quote-unquote assist Nimna, but they needed more, and Baekje sent a request along with gifts to Yamato to presumably help offset some of the costs. Yeo Chiang then headed back to the front with Shilla, and there he built a fortification at a place the records called Kutamura. King Song, worried for his eldest son, decided to go to the front to see him there. The Samguksagi says that he assumed personal command of a force of about 50,000 foot and mounted soldiers and attacked the fortress of Mount Kwansan along with the Karyan, which some have identified as Gara troops, though it could be a reference to any number of troops from the areas in between Bekje and Shilla, or possibly something else. The Shilla military governor of the recently annexed Bekje territories came down to assist on his side. During the combat, which seemed to be leaning in Bekje's favor, a Shilla leader named Todo made a sudden attack which ended up killing King Song. This caused his army to break and the Shilla troops pursued them. The records say the Shilla troops beheaded around 30,000 Bekje soldiers and four of their highest ranking nobles. In the Nihon Shoki, they note this battle as well, though not quite in the same detail, simply stating that Shilla brought all their forces to bear on the king. They also mention that he was captured and beheaded, with Shilla keeping his head, but eventually sending his bones back to be buried. Prince Yo Chang, meanwhile, found himself surrounded, and according to the Nihon Shoki, it was a man, perhaps several men, from Tsukushi, aka Kyushu, who began to fire arrows so fast that they were able to open a hole in the opposing lines, allowing Yo Chang to escape. Here, instead of pursuing the fleeing troops, the Nihon Shoki claims that Shilla held off because of the fear of the mighty Yamato, which 
sounds more like embellishment by the chroniclers. Following that defeat, Prince Yochang sent his younger brother, Prince Ke, to the Yamato court to inform them that their father had been killed and request more troops to avenge him. Sogono Iname, the Omi, consoled Prince Ke. He then hearkened back to the time of Wakata Keru no Okimi, aka Yuraku Tenno, and suggested that they should build a shrine to Ona Muchi no Kami and worship him once more. This last part probably seems a bit odd. As we'll discuss later, Sogono Iname by this point had been selected to help experiment with Buddhism and Buddhist practices, but a lot of Yamato decisions still balanced elements of practical and strategic thinking with elements of kami worship. Without the kami on your side, there was very little that you could accomplish. This would also seem to be further evidence of links between the kami worshipped in Japan and peninsular practices. Aston suggests there's a link here with the peninsular worship of Tankun, the legendary heavenly progenitor of Gojosun. Onamuchi, as you may recall, had ties with Izumo, but worship of Onamuchi may have either come from or spread to the peninsula as well. The idea of a great landholder seems to be a fairly nebulous and not particularly location-specific concept. Whether or not there's a link with Tankun is perhaps, though, a tenuous assumption to make. It seems there was some urging by Sogano Iname to join common worship to help bring about victory, though it is unclear if Prince K actually took him up on this suggestion. By this point, Bekje was fairly well immersed in Buddhism, and the ruling elite were practicing Buddhists, though, as we'll talk about in later episodes, Buddhism doesn't necessarily require that people abandon the worship of local gods, though there often is some amount of conflict between the two. Later that year, back in Baekje, with the mourning ceremonies for the late King Song concluded, Prince Yo Chang announced a desire to retire from the world and practice religion for the sake of his father. This practice of taking the robes of a monk and making merit for one's father is not uncommon in some Buddhist traditions. Certainly in Japan, it became the norm for sovereigns to retire and to take Buddhist vows. But that was typically after they had reigned for some period of time, and it was rarely a full withdrawal from the world. As it was, Yo Chang's own court suggested that while it might be the filial and Buddhist thing to do, he had to also think about the state of the nation as a whole. Instead, they suggested that he have 100 people, quote-unquote, enter religion on his behalf, which would seem to mean that they were forcibly tonsured. Presumably, this was to make merit for him and his father while he ran the country. Both the Nihon Shoki and the Samguk Sagi have something of a pause here, at least for a few years. Bekje had received a pretty terrible defeat at the hands of Shilla, and along with internal issues of getting everything back under control, it may have been a period of rebuilding. In Yamato, they note the arrival of several succeeding envoys from Shilla, who were basically given the cold shoulder. Shilla seems to have then given up diplomatic relations for a while, and worked itself to fortify its own borders. The chroniclers, of course, note that this was because they feared a Yamato invasion. There may be something to that. Not so much that they feared being overrun, mind you, but historically, raids by Wa sailors against the Shilla coast were not uncommon occurrences. In 561, the Samguk Sagi once again notes Bekje dispatching troops to raid and plunder Shilla's territory. The Shilla annals in the same source note this in 562, which may simply be the difference between when Bekje began to gather troops and when they actually attacked. Bekje lost a thousand soldiers in that debacle. That same year, the Samguk Sagi notes that Gara rebelled and a Shilla force was sent to put down the rebellion. In the Nihon Shoki, it said that Nimna was destroyed by Shilla this year, and a comment included in the Nihon Shoki states that this meant Gara, Ara, Saiki, Tara, Choma, Kochi, Chata, Sampanha, Kuison, and Imye, ten states in total. Quoting the Tongkam, Aston says that the sources only mention Great Gara, or Degaya. Here again we see confusion in the sources, but it does seem there was some kind of rebellion perhaps in the area that Shilla had conquered. According to the Nihon Shoki, Yamato sent troops to the front lines to help support Nimna against Shilla, working with their ally Bekje, who was just off their own defeat. Compound matters, an envoy from Yamato to Bekje ended up losing a letter as well as some of the bows and arrows that he was transporting along the way, 
and these fell into the hands of Shilla, which gave them crucial intelligence on what was being planned. The Yamato generals for this endeavor were Kino Maru no Sukune and Kawabe no Omi no Nie. Kino Maru appears to have had some early successes, and he encouraged the troops. Kawabe no Nie, however, was inexperienced. Apparently, he was appointed more because of his position on the court rather than his military expertise. During one of the encounters with the Shilla troops, he had them pinned down, and the Shilla troops raised a white flag, a symbol, even back then, of a desire for a ceasefire to talk terms and possibly surrender. Nie, however, was unaccustomed to warfare, and when he saw them wave the white flag, he raised his own white flag in response, apparently thinking that it would stop the fighting or something? I don't know. To the Shilla troops, however, it looked like he was then giving up as well, and so they lowered their flag and redoubled their efforts. Shilla eventually routed the Yamato vanguard, and many were injured. Some commanders even abandoned their troops, rushing back to the safety of their own fortifications. Nie survived, withdrawing to a nearby plain, but his troops' confidence in him as a leader was shot, and they basically stopped listening to him. With little to no unit cohesion, they became easy prey for Shilla forces, who rounded them all up, including the camp followers and Nie's own wife, who was there with him. Her name was Mumashihime, daughter of Sakamoto no Omi. Here I'm going to take a pause on what happened next. Let's just say that Nie continued his less than heroic streak, and that his wife paid the price. I'll have more in the show notes at sengokudaimyo.com slash podcast, but we really don't need to go into the gory details of it all here to get the bigger picture, as I really just want to set up what comes next. You see, in contrast to Nihei's behavior is the story of another man named Mitsugi no Kishino Ikina. Ikina refused to submit to Shilla. Threatening him with death, the Shilla commander made him remove his trousers, and he tried to force him to humiliate himself further by pointing his posterior towards Yamato and crying out, and I quote, Yamato generals, bite my ass. And yes, that is what the Chronicles say happened. Apparently that phrase is more universal than one might have suspected. Aston even makes the comment that there wasn't really a good word for kiss in old Japanese and that bite was probably the equivalent for the times. Either way, I think you get the meaning. Anyway, even threatened with death, Ikina refused to submit, and instead he cried out, let the king of Shilla bite my ass. Well, things went downhill from there, and the Shilla forces put him to death, along with his son, who had run out to comfort him. There's a song given for his wife, Obako, who had also been captured with him, which comes down to us as, Karakuni no kinoe ni tatashi, Obako wa hire fura sumiyu nani wa ni mukite. Standing on the walls of the country of Gara, Obako is seen to wave her scarf, turning towards Naniwa. In the end, the sources agree that Shilla was victorious, the rebellious region submitted, and Yamato troops withdrew. And there were no more major conflicts with Shilla after that, at least not during Ame Kuniyoshi's reign. There is one more martial account, however, and it immediately follows on the footsteps of the disastrous raid of 562. Thousands of Yamato troops, working with help from Bekje and under the command of O Tomo no Sarehiko, the son of Otomo no Kanamura, attacked a city in Goryo territory where the king himself was staying. The king fled and Sarehiko returned with numerous items of loot. These included a rich brocaded curtain that had been found in the king's chambers, which was gifted to the sovereign. In addition, he gifted to Sogano Iname, the Oomi, apparently the most powerful person at court at this point, two suits of armor, two swords mounted in gold, three copper bells with chasings, two flags of various colors, and a beautiful woman and her attendant who had been captured and enslaved in the fighting. There was also an iron building, possibly a shrine, that had been taken from a tower in the city and which was for a while kept in a temple known as Choanji. But by the time the chroniclers were recording the Nihon Shoki, nobody was quite sure where that was or what had happened to us. Maybe it had just rusted away. This all seems odd to follow on to the disaster of the raid on Shilla and the utter subjugation of the various states between Shilla and Bekje, and it isn't referenced in the Samguk Sagi at all that I could find. 
Then again, there's a general lack of any references at this point in the Samguk Sagi, so that may not mean as much as it seems. It could be that this was placed here just to provide some kind of victory in the face of such a crushing defeat by Shilla. Then again, it's quite possible that Yamato and Bekja troops did use the opportunity to attack a Goguryeo that was still weakened and reeling from its losses to the Bekja Shilla alliance years earlier. Speaking of which, whatever alliance Bekja and Shilla may have had, the annexation of all the Gara states by Shilla had put an end to it. Now Bekja and Shilla shared a common border with no buffer states between them. It was clear that Shilla was now Bekja's number one rival, as opposed to the weakened Goguryeo. From the beginning of Ame Kuniyoshi's reign to now, whether or not Yamato had actually played a significant part in it, it was clear that the balance of power had shifted on the peninsula, and Shilla was a rising threat. Still, Yamato had big dreams, perhaps bigger than they could accomplish on their own. In 571, Ame Kuniyoshi passed away. But as he lay dying, he urged his successor, Crown Prince Nunakura Futotamashiki, a.k.a. Bidatsu Tenno, to continue to fight to reestablish Nimna, which would become something of a causus belli, as I said before, through at least the reign of Toyomike Kashikiyahime, a.k.a. Suiko Tenno, with the last reference to Nimna being made in the second year of Taika, or about 646, a good 75 years later. Notably, this deathbed request is the only real mention of Nina in the Sendai Kuji Hongi, and some have suggested that many of the more florid embellishments may have come from about the time of Kashikiya Hime, helped justify her court's own military campaigns. Based purely on the conflict over Nina and the other states collectively known as the Gara or Gaia Confederation, it would seem like this period was a huge loss for Yamato. And yet, the close cooperation and dialogue with Bekje brought numerous gifts to the island. This included further teachings from the continent that would help continue to shape the Yamato court with greater and more effective technologies that would strengthen the central government. And then there was the introduction of Buddhism, which also had come around this time, and which will be the subject of our next several episodes. Until then, let me thank you for listening and thank you for all of your support. If you like what we're doing, please tell your friends and feel free to rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. If you feel the need to do more and want to help us keep this thing going, we have information about how you can donate on Patreon or through Coffee site, ko-fi.com, ko-fi.com, slash sengokudaimyo, or find the links over at our main website, sengokudaimyo.com, slash podcast, where we will have some more discussion on topics from this episode. That's all for now. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next episode on Sengoku Daimyo's Chronicles of Japan.